promised myself that I would not do any new modeling myself because that's much better done with the professionals. And I know that scientists just love to tinker around and, and make their own models of what's going on. Um, and I was quite well behaved and it was about six months before eventually I cracked and uh, decided that I would have a go at uh, modeling myself. Um, there were basically two people that, uh, that got me into it, who I'll, I'll show you on the next slide with quotes that represent what they say, although they didn't actually say it in so many words. Uh, this is David Wallace, who uh, you uh, would have just seen. Um, there we go, there's a pointer there. Um, so David emailed me about his, his work with spreadsheets saying, look, I can predict these R numbers two weeks ahead of the SPIOM consensus, and I'm not doing anything very complicated. And at that point, I thought, well, maybe this modeling isn't quite as difficult as it seems. And the other um, uh, formative comment was from my son, James, who was living at home at the time because of uh, COVID and lockdown, who basically says, nobody cares about what you're doing, Dad. And these are the two formative things that uh, guided what I did subsequently with, with WSS. It's not particularly difficult. And B, you have to address the question of who cares what you're doing? Um, James uh, ultimately wrote the first version of the code and taught me to code in R, which is quite a, a pleasant old dog new trick thing for me to, to have learned as well. Um, and uh, this has been one of the most enjoyable things that I've done in science for a while, learning a ton of new stuff. Um, in my day job, I um, look at high pressure materials with, with computer simulations. Um, so, you know, I, I could have not done this. I could have quite happily gone on studying the theory of high pressure barium tetrahydride and uh, colleagues and uh, postdocs of mine who wish I'd have spent more time on that. Um, I was really keen to do something useful right now. And so this was the motivation behind um, uh, the WSS model. Uh, what was I interested in doing? Well, the science, and you remember those words, the science being bandied around a lot. So I, you dig into what the science is and it's spreadsheets that appear on the BBC and charts and things. Our numbers, and what's going to happen in the next month seemed to be the thing that, uh, that people were mainly interested in. So to do something useful right now, rather than try to build a beautiful epidemic model like the people doing June were able to do with, with a, a large team of people, um, I was going to be working with a, with a small group of people, with David and, and James. Uh, and so we had to focus on what we could practically do and what would be most useful. Uh, how would you do it? Well, using real data that actually exists, uh, building a model and validating it. And this is one of the nice things about working uh, in an ongoing pandemic, that you can make predictions, you can make a call for what's going to happen in the next month, and you know really quickly whether you got it right or whether you got it wrong. And that's actually quite unusual in uh, uh, in physics, where you maybe have to build a huge experiment to test any predictions. And um, I also have a philosophy, which is the kind of physics philosophy of things, which is to uh, build a simple model and only enhance it, only improve it when it breaks. So this is kind of the opposite philosophy from the, um, the, the big agent-based models like Covisim and, uh, and June, where you try to account for everything you might think is important and putting in everything you think is important should guarantee that the things that are really important are in there. Um, what we were interested to do in the way that David described was to build a simple model saying that uh, for the things we care about, our numbers and medium term predictions, maybe we don't need very much information to go in. Uh, so USS is about including COVID specific epidemiological parameters. Uh, when we have a flu epidemic next year, it will be probably useless because it's so tailored to, to COVID sim. Uh, here's a quote from Chris Whitty that, um, uh, that David gave you just now. Um, getting it right quickly is important and the quickly thing was, was kind of crucial. And that factored in two ways into what we were doing. First of all, of course, I wanted the code to um, uh, 
run fast, but also that the input data should be um, uh, the most up-to-date indicator of what was going on. I'll explain a little bit more what that means eventually, but basically that's why we prefer to use cases rather than deaths or hospitalizations, which are a little bit later on from the infection. Um, so I wanted to go with the, uh, the, the Chris Whitty thing rather than um, the, the classic uh, uh, physicist approach. This is uh, Feynman's book, What Do You Care What Other People Think? If you're getting into a new field, you need to care deeply about what other people think and uh, what they want to do. So what am I gonna do? Um, I'm gonna try and calculate R numbers by parameterizing uh, model across the whole pandemic. I'm gonna try and calculate hospitalizations I'm going to calculate deaths. And I'm going to do that in two ways. I'm going to do some hindcasting, which was to, to look back across the whole of the pandemic and see if uh, the model as it stands now would have worked um, a year ago. And I'm also going to, to do the things that other people want. And now casting, what's the R number now and what medium predictions are going to come. And this was driven by um, uh, what uh, the Joint Biosecurity Centre we're publishing and we're looking for each uh, each week. Uh, so calculating R. Now calculating R is is rather more interesting than you might think. As far as I'm concerned, R should be defined as the number of onward infections per person. That's the most fundamental idea in epidemiology. Um, and so you might cast that into well, it's the uh, rate of change of uh, uh, the number of infected people divided by the number of infected people, um, which if you like maths, you can write as a log derivative. If you don't like maths, you don't have to worry about the log, you can write it like this. And R is defined as the thing which would appear in the exponent here. We haven't got this data. There aren't people going out surveying, capturing the moment when infections happen. The data we're going to use is cases, and that's going to introduce a delay of three or four days between infection and the cases being reported. Uh, and this number here, C of T, is the number of cases that, that, that happen each day. And that's not what's reported either. So what's actually reported is a thing that um, uh, I call C naught tilde, uh, which is the actual reports that you can pull from the government website. Um, and what do I think that is? So what I think that is, is the actual case data, which I want, um, which has associated with it some systematic error in time, which I know. And that's basically the week, weekend effect, uh, the seven day fluctuations. Um, this is somehow unknown. That there are going to be uh, fluctuations uh, during the week. Um, and what I actually do is assume that the, the number of people getting infected on a Monday is actually the same as on a Tuesday when counted across the whole of the epidemic. So I take averages for what numbers I expect on each day to uh, be the same. And I divide the actual statistics by uh, uh, an appropriate number to achieve that. And then on top of that, there's a kind of uh, there's a stochastic reporting error because there's always going to be noise in any data stream uh, and so uh, there's this term here which I don't know what it is so this is a random variable um, uh, and all I know from general statistical uh, principles is that uh, the size of this should be about the square root of the uh, uh, the size of the signal so that's a normal stochastic thing um, so when I do a derivative here um, I have to worry about this a of t which I and do the derivative of because it's just a variation in time and this stochastic uh, uh, term here. Um, so uh, much of this was covered in, in David's talk so uh, <clears throat> uh, I won't go into this uh, uh, too deeply. Um, but I will say a little bit more about what are these things really the same are as the number of infected people? So one little little kind of aside, which I uh, uh, I find interesting, is uh, what I call it the urban-rural paradox, but it's equally true of different age groups, which is that um, the R of people who are getting infected 
is different from the R of the people who are doing the infection. And this isn't about super spreading events. This is just about population densities. So I'm sure everybody's familiar with the, uh, the SIR model. Um, if you complicate it a little bit and take it into, uh, uh, into two regions, we have a population which has a very high R area. So here we are, R1, people uh, in a big urban situation spreading uh, disease everywhere, uh, unavoidably. And another region where the intrinsic R is very low. So this is the Highlands of Scotland, not likely to catch COVID from anybody here anytime soon. You can write an SIR model here where these two places are coupled and the urban population spends some fraction of its time in, in the rural area. And when they're in the rural area, they're biking or whatever, so they're not, not spreading the disease particularly either. Uh, the coupled equations uh, look like this, um, and you can solve it analytically. It's, it's very straightforward. Um, what uh, I think is, is interesting is, is to calculate the R number at all of the calculations that people do to get at R numbers would predict from this, this situation. So uh, if there was no mixing, then uh, SIR model over time, we have a high R number for the, um, uh, the urban population, I've set it at two, a low number for the, um, uh, the rural population, I've set it at 0.5. Infection will never happen in the rural network, that stays low. The, um, in the urban region, it starts high and then drops off as we reach herd immunity. But now with a little tiny amount of um, <clears throat> mixing, things change and they change a lot because all of the infections in the rural area, or almost all of them, are driven by people coming in from the urban areas. Uh, and so the rate of growth of infection in the rural areas, this R number, mimics number of infected people that are coming in. So it's the same as the rate of growth in the urban areas. Um, and if you drive your policy based on these R of T's, the fact that nobody's actually doing any infections in the rural area will be lost because the R of T's look the same. And so if you have a policy intervention that uh, uh, is applied to stop transmission in the rural area based on R, then it won't have any effect at all because what's really driving it is infections uh, from incoming people that uh, have happened elsewhere. So what I'm trying to get at here is that R isn't the main, necessarily the right thing to drive interventions. You should also consider the total uh, uh, number of, uh, uh, of cases in an area. Um, <clears throat> also in terms of R, I, um, I did a little SIR model where, uh, um, I had a, a lattice on which uh, uh, the SIR model works. Um, I, I put this up actually because when I moved to Edinburgh just over 30 years ago, um, the Parallel Computing Centre had just been started by David Wallace. And the first code that I ever wrote on a parallel computer was the SIR model on a, on a, on a lattice. And if you look on the internet, you can find dozens and dozens of implementations of this. Uh, but something people don't look at is what is the R number of those models? So this is a model where you have a lattice, you infect one side, it affects its neighbors and, and they spread. Uh, you can evaluate the R number in the, the traditional way, um, but what you find, and this is, um, <clears throat> uh, is kind of interesting, that if you set the R number which is in SIR the ratio of the probability of being infected to recovered, something like two or six or whatever, and you allow the model to run, then uh, there are two possibilities. Either the model will uh, uh, give you uh, the epidemic dying out, or the epidemic will spread and fill the whole system. When it spreads and fills the whole system, it doesn't spread with the initial value of R that you set. So this graph here shows things with R naught, the initial R values from one to 10. So 10 would be way off the uh, slide here. Very quickly, what you see within a, a couple of generations is that the R number you would measure by differentiating the infections drops to one. 
and uh, basically stays there with, with some noise. Um, this is true on a, on a lattice. And what's happening there basically is you, you have some kind of re reaction diffusion process where you have a, a wave spreading steadily through the lattice. Um, and each person is strongly in contact with other people who have recently become recovered, i.e. in particular, the person that just infected them. And that leads to uh, an epidemic that does spread. It does fill the entire system. If you measure the R number from it, it doesn't look like R0-10 that you put in and you get in a well-mixed model. Um, it actually goes to one. Uh, and you can do a small world network, which is uh, a similar kind of thing, and you see some of the behavior. Um, and that's also important because it tells you something about what kind of R number you need in order for the epidemic to spread. So this is the R zero number on these models, and these are various lattices, square lattices, triangular lattices, randomly connected lattices. And the point I want to make here is that we normally think you need an R naught, and this will be the initial rate of, um, <clears throat> of exponential growth. You need an R naught greater than one for disease to spread everywhere. But in fact, in these lattice models, that's not true. You need an, uh, an R naught much larger than one, depending on the details of the, uh, the connectivity of the lattice. Um, so again, if you measure the R of the disease in the initial stages, it will grow exponentially and grow really fast. If it's it can be as high as two or three, or even in some uh, uh, in some kinds of, uh, of loosely connected network as high as four or five. This very fast early growth doesn't indicate that it will, will spread and go everywhere. Um, <clears throat> and, and so, what is this is this relevant or not? Well. If you look at the case data from the UK, and everybody's seen this graph many times, what you see is kind of interesting, that, that you see these peaks that pop up. This is uh, the initial peak when we weren't really doing very much testing, so we don't know how high this one is. Secondary peak here, uh, peak in January uh, 21. And each of these peaks lasts for about three generations. Um, now, it's impossible to tell whether that's a network effect or a lockdown effect. In each case, we, we put a lockdown in. Uh, here's the Euro 20 peak that David talked about. Is that a thing? Probably. It's also the Delta, fun um, Delta coming in. Um, and here's Omicron. And we didn't really do very much in terms of additional lockdowns. In fact, if anything, Omicron was correlated with, with things opening up. Again, there's this rather characteristic of about two weeks, we go from exponential growth to actually uh, exponential growth phase is over. So what happens in the models and appears to fit with the data is there's a, a sharp transient period of about two weeks or three generations where we have proper exponential growth with proper R zero. And then we get into a state where the um, <clears throat> uh, the disease is spreading more as a reaction diffusion thing with an R number closer to one or maybe even less. Um, just to say a little bit now about the, uh, the full WSS model and the, the predictions we did. It's a compartment model. So uh, if you saw Ian's talk early on, I had almost identical uh, um, uh, model to uh, this with various compartments of how one goes from a case through various levels of illness um, severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, death, critical and critical recovery. In WSS, we use this weight scale and shifted thing, which is implemented as a, a log normal time kernel. Um, if it showed that actually it's probably better to use the real data for the time from deaths to cases. Um, that's, that's what we do. Uh, um, <clears throat> enables us to do a few things and um, things that come out of the data, I, I find it interesting. So the first thing that, that I like to do in, is in terms of modeling is to fix the parameters, make the simplest case possible and watch how the model breaks. So there's this famous quote from um, uh, Box's model quote, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, I take that a little bit further and I say, so all models are wrong, some are useful, and they're specifically useful when they're wrong. So if you have a model that's, that's trundling along quite, uh, uh, quite nicely, predicting what's going on. So here, for example, we have the, um, uh, 
uh, how well our model was in predicting uh, cases uh, against actual cases. So one is correct prediction, and this is what David was showing. And that worked fairly well through the latter stages of 2020, and then suddenly it broke. Uh, and when it breaks, it tells you that some assumption that you made is not valid anymore. The assumption that we made, we decided here wasn't particularly valid, was that there was no new variant. So this is the alpha variant coming in, and suddenly our predictions are out by 40%. Um, so this enables us by this, this kind of type one modeling, wait for the model to break and then go, oh, something new must have happened because the model broke. And then you can dig in to say, well, is it really what you think it is? Is it really the alpha variant? And, and the kind of signature you can look at is that it goes wrong earlier in the southeast uh, and later in the north. And so just as the spread of the variant was, was correlated with, with, with regions, uh, you see the same thing uh, happening there. Um, another, watch how the model breaks. These fatality ratios, um, <clears throat> kind of bubbling along at some, uh, some value here, popping up with alpha and then dropping through early 2021 and that correlate you can go well that correlates with the vaccines and it's worth reminding ourselves that maybe two years ago when people were saying i hope we have vaccines people believed that what vaccines would achieve was they would stop the spread of the disease what they turned out to be the most valuable uh, uh, contribution from vaccines is they stopped people dying and that wasn't even tested for, remember, in the clinical trials. It was all about, will it stop, uh, stop the spread? Um, so I think way back uh, at the start of the vaccine rollout, this kind of uh, study was, was really valuable as showing evidence that actually um, vaccination was causing people who were diagnosed with the cases. It hadn't saved them from catching the disease, but it did save them from, from, being, from dying from it. And now by splitting the, uh, uh, the data up by age group, we can see that the first age group that this beneficial drop in CFR was the older people. And this correlates again very strongly with which age groups were receiving the vaccination, the benefit arriving later for the younger age groups uh, as they got the vaccination later on. So a very useful way of using models, I think, is to uh, set the model up with a very simple fixed parameters. And when it breaks, it tells you something happened. Um, Type two modeling um, <clears throat> is, uh, is the kind of hind casting. Um, can we fit the whole epidemic? So in order to get at parameters, um, I just showed you the model broke. So let's fix it. Let's put in uh, uh, terms for variants and for vaccines. And, and David talked a little bit about how you might do that uh, to fit across the whole epidemic. Uh, and this is just to show that uh, across the whole, whole patch, once you include variants and vaccines, uh, the model, which is the uh, solid line here, does pretty well for uh, admissions, for hospital uh, occupation, uh, and for deaths. And of course, I can run it forward into the future. Um, if you want to be a little bit worried, you should notice that uh, the model is currently underpredicting and more than ever what's going on. So this is fitted to one variety of, uh, of Omicron, the original Omicron. Um, and with, it hasn't changed for the new Omicron. So this, you know, if you want to be a bit worried that the newest variant of Omicrons might be a bit more severe than the original one, there's some evidence that that's the case. Uh, if that's right, you heard it here first. If it turns out to be wrong, then hey-ho, I'm only a high-pressure modeler. What do I know? Um, so that's the second way, uh, mode in which you can use this kind of models. Uh, and the third, of course, is to do uh, is to do predictions, um, which uh, I uh, I do every uh, every Monday night and Tuesday morning, and send them off to uh, uh, the nice people at DSTL, and they put it into their Risk Aware software. Uh, oh, sorry, there's a company called Risk Aware. They put it into their Crystalcast software, and this is the uh, uh, the epitome of the uh, worry about who cares. So, in writing the code. I designed the compartments so that they would map onto what uh, was used by Crystalcast in the actual um, <clears throat> uh, in the actual software that 
was going to be passed on to, to spy him for, for the prediction. And it was really important not to just say, oh, I would like to make my own type of um, <clears throat> uh, type of predictions with my own formatting. It was essential in getting this, this to be useful uh, to map on to what other people had decided to do. What I would care what other people think because that's the software I have to match to. Uh, and I can predict other things, but nobody may care. Um, and so here's here's the prediction that I uh, I sent in, uh, in yesterday, and it's perhaps not tremendously exciting. This is the uh, the hospital bed stuff. Uh, left of the dotted line is the uh, um, uh, actual data up to today. Dotted line, March twenty second, yesterday when I sent the thing in, and here are the predictions. And you can see that the uh, predictions that I make, and this is true of the other models as well as of yesterday generally show hospitalizations and by implication deaths going up um, for into April and then tailing off as, uh, um, as in this case we really do start to approach herd immunity where almost everybody has, has had it. Um, there's a big debate in, uh, uh, in the area whether we should call these predictions or, um, uh, or scenarios. There are assumptions that go into this, most notably that there won't be a new variant that is um, uh, is very much more uh, <clears throat> uh, more lethal than, than the Omicron is at the moment. Uh, that could be a real game changer in these predictions. Of course, you can put that into the model, and that I think of as being a scenario. You know, what if there was a new variant that was as dangerous as Delta was and is as infectious as Omicron? Um, and we can do that, and uh, we, we, we make uh, uh, predictions like that. Um, okay, so that's basically uh, all that I want to say today. USS is a very simple model. It's driven by cases for a good reason, because cases are kind of the leading indicator, and things like hospitalizations and deaths are lagging indicators, and will only tell you what happened uh, a while back. Uh, David talked about why WSS could predict our numbers ahead of what was published by the government. I think the answer to that is that many of the codes that contribute to those want to get the answer right. And in order to get the answer right, they include not just information from cases, but also information from hospitalizations and deaths and all these other data streams. And the price you pay for using those other data streams is that everything is delayed. The WSS sends in estimates for R up to today, but uh, because of the decisions that have been made by, by SPY-M, the consensus is published for two weeks ago. So they take the WSS predictions from two weeks ago, um, which is kind of frustrating because I see these numbers at the meeting and I go, yeah, but that's, that's out of date and I know what's going on now. Um, and I think this is, to some extent a failure to understand Chris Whitty's point about uh, yes it you can get a 95% model correct if you use all the data streams available but if you use the, the fastest data stream you can have your prediction now and it'll be 80% correct and in fact looking at the predictions that, that we've done over the last three months uh, the USS is usually slapping in the middle of everything else. So it's not, it's not doing too badly, even though it's ignoring a bunch of data, data streams. So uh, um, <clears throat> kernels are informed by data. So the model is driven by cases. Parameters are continually updated by looking back in time uh, and, and hind casting. The whole model was designed to be useful, care about what other people think. There's no attempt to model transmission and in a sense, that saves some uh, potential errors in the, the modeling. Because I'm only driven by cases, any uncertainties in how uh, infections translate into cases will be smoothed over. And um, uh, so I, I can avoid that by not uh, modeling transmission. And crucially, things like the ratio between reported cases and um, <clears throat> uh, and actual transmission cancel out 
in these R numbers um, and uh, in the other things which I used to predict later on. They're all folded into the kernels because they are uh, how I go from reported cases through to other things. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's no attempt to, to make the code transferable to other data streams or other epidemics. Um, it does have this hind casting. I can see how well I model the entire epidemic. Now casting, what's the R number now? And what's going to happen in future? Future casting. Um, and the general philosophy has always been I only add features when the, uh, the now casting or the hind casting, uh, really the now casting, because the hind casting has enabled me to change the parameters. So when this fails, it tells me I need to do something. And the three things that uh, we needed to do, first of all, the uh, the very first model that I think even David didn't talk about was, was to do it without age weighting. That just doesn't work. And so we've had age weighting in from the start. Um, and then, as I said, when the alpha variant came in, the model broke. Uh, and so we have to fix up the, uh, the kernels to account for the variant. When the vaccination came in, the model broke again and we had to code for vaccination. Okay, so that's uh, that's all I have for you today. I will uh, stop now. I'm a little bit over time, but I did start late, so uh, I will excuse myself. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, and I realised I, I, I forgot to introduce you at the very beginning, but um, I think Everybody here knows who you are, so apologies for not uh, actually introducing you. Um, uh, no worries, that gave me an extra 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Let me stop.